So good morning, everybody. Uh, you're very, very welcome to Engineers Ireland. Um, and for those of you who are in the building for the first time, um, you're particularly welcome um, to this event, uh, this air grid event. And uh, I would also like to warmly welcome the people that are joining us online as well. So my name is Dee Kyo. I'm CPD Director with Engineers Ireland. And it's my pleasure to uh, to open this event, which I hope you're going to find very interesting and and fruitful. Um, so it, obviously, uh, this, it's a briefing session for t tomorrow's energy scenarios consultation process, which is open at the moment. Um, before we commence, just to let you know the exits, there's one up here. And for those in the in the room here, there's one down there. There's no fire drill planned, but in the event of the real thing, um, if you could go out one of those, and you'll be shown then out to the front of the uh, the, the garden. So uh, Kieran and Podrick, uh, both senior engineers with uh, Airgrid, are going to facilitate the the session here this morning, and. Um, I just want to wish Eric with the very best with the consultation process. So I'll hand you over now to Kieran. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Dee. Um, we're really delighted to uh, to have the opportunity to to brief everybody on our uh, tomorrow's energy scenarios consultation. So the the idea of the event is to uh, is to to arm our stakeholders with a little bit more information so that you can. You can appraise our, our consultation as much as possible. So, um, contained within the consultation is a whole set of, of inputs which we'll use in the next phase of our, of our process, which is a, a generation dispatch modeling phase. So, we're really looking for, for any feedback that you, you have um, on how we can improve those, those inputs and assumptions. So, I'll, I'll just start with, with a presentation outline. So, we have seven different sections we'll, we'll run through today. Um, I'll start off and cover a background on tomorrow's energy scenarios, or, or TES as we as we refer to it. Um, I'll then step you through the framework for, for developing TES. I'll hand over to my colleague Podrig and he'll run through um, assumptions relating to demand, generation, interconnection. We'll have a piece on CO2 neutral operation of, of power systems and then we'll finish off with, with conclusions and questions. So I, I, I will ask, as we go along, if there are questions, if you just take note of them, and we have plenty of time at the end to, to cover them off. Um, for any of our online viewers, if, if you have questions, you can direct them to scenarios at airgrid.com, and we, we'll do our best to, to cover them off. Okay, so just moving on. So we'll start with a, with a background of TES. Um, just, just a quick introduction on Airgrid and, and who we are. So Airgrid is the licensed transmission system operator in Ireland. So we're, we're the TSO in Ireland, and we operate the flow of, of, of power on the high voltage grid and plan for its future. So, so our license obligation is to ensure that we have a safe, secure, and reliable grid into the future. And in 2017, we introduced scenario planning to help with that. So the, the series of publications relating to, scenario, relating to TES 2017 are, are online, and we have some copies at the back of the room if anybody is interested. Um, so the reason that we're here today is because we've, we've, we've we started a revision of our, of our scenarios, um, and we're now into TES 2019, which is, which is part of our two-year cycle. The, the consultation report is available online, and again, we really urge people um, both online and, and present here today to to appraise the, the inputs within that document and provide as much feedback as, as you can before we close on, on August 9th. And just, just a quick note on, on the system operator in Northern Ireland, or, or SOMI. They're currently preparing scenarios for Northern Ireland, and we expect to see a, a similar publication for Northern Ireland in the coming months. And put to, but today is, is purely focused on, on Ireland and the air grid scenarios. So just moving along. What, what, what is the, the purpose of TES, so, so why do we do it? Um, at Airgrid, we have, we have a six-step process for, for developing the grid. And in step one, we, we identify the future needs of the grid, and this is where our scenarios come in. So we use our scenarios to, to create a, a credible range of, of outcomes for the electricity system in Ireland, and we use those that, that range to test the performance of the grid out to 2040. So we're really taking a long-term view of the performance of the grid over that time frame. Um, 
using scenarios and the, the data contained within within those within the scenarios is important because it helps us identify the scale of, of future needs, the different types of future needs, and, and the timing of those needs. And um, we also had feedback to say that TES is, is is useful for informing the energy and and climate policy debate. And we're very happy to receive that feedback. And it's also a useful reference for industry and, and academia. So, so moving along, we have a number of steps that we follow in developing TES. Um, just focusing on the documents, at the moment we have a draft consultation report open. And it closes on August 9th. So contained within that, as I mentioned earlier, are inputs that we will use in the next phase of modeling. Um, the outputs of that modeling will, be, will, will help us to form up our final scenarios, which we will publish in September. Following on from that, we will then perform a whole heap of um, performance tests on the grid using the final scenarios and publish the results in the system needs assessment report, which is due in, in December 2019. Okay, so a little bit on the upcoming reports. The, the, the consultation report highlights a whole heap of in, inputs to our modeling phase, but we expect to have additional information in the final set. Um, so the information contained within the, the final set will be will include outputs from modeling. So in there, we, we're, we're likely to see, or we, we will include information on the system services required to, to achieve different levels of res -E in line with the scenarios. We'll have information on DSM and demand side management on how that affects electricity use. We'll also have metrics on carbon intensity of the power sector. So we expect to see quite a lot more information in, in the final report. On system needs, we will have information on how we've tested the performance of the grid over over the, the, the period out to 2040. Um, so we, we, we run thousands of snapshots against multiple hours against the scenarios to see where needs may materialize due to all of this change that, that, that is predicted in the energy system. So. I suppose the slide here is just to, to, to highlight that if there's any information that you would like to see contained within those reports, we're happy for you to feed that in as part of this consultation and we'll do our best to include it in, in, in those publications. Right, so, so the TES framework, um, these slides describe how we've come up with our draft scenarios. And I'll start by introducing them. So the first scenario is the first of three. Revised scenarios is um, centralized energy. So centralized energy is a plan-led world in which Ireland achieves a low carbon future. So th this, this scenario aligns with the ambition in the Climate Action Plan. So we've taken information from the Climate Action Plan and reflected those in our scenarios. Um, so it's a 70% res -E scenario in 2030. Um, it's, it's very much a, a centralized scenario. And what we mean by that is we have a lot of renewable generation connecting to the transmission system. So it adopts the ambition in the Climate Action Plan to have at least 3.5 gigawatts of offshore in Ireland by 2030. It's, it doesn't quite adopt the, um, the level of ambition electrification from the Climate Action Plan and it's slightly behind targets on, on heat and transport in terms of electrification. Delayed transition. So th th this, this is, a, is an important scenario for, for us. It, delayed transition is a world in which decarbonization progress is made, but the pace is not sufficient to meet climate objectives. So th this scenario is, is, a, is a counterfactual to the ambition set out in the Climate Action Plan. It doesn't achieve a 70% res -E level by 2030. It's a 60% level. And it doesn't quite meet the adoption levels in electrification of heat and transport. But, but again, it, it's a very important scenario as a counterfactual, and it allows us to identify the types of needs and the timing of needs associated with a scenario where we don't meet targets. And community action is, 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 the, is the, the third scenario. It's a world where sustainability and economic circularity are core to future decisions, and citizens recognize climate change as a risk and take appropriate action. So this is very much a, a centralized scenario where we have an increase in growth of, of centralized renewable generation connecting to the distribution system. There's also a growth in, in microgeneration and, and, and solar PV. We don't 
uh, on, on the demand side, there's significant growth in, in electrification of heat and transport, and it adopts the figures from the climate action plan in, 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 that, in those sectors. Um, I suppose the, the, the real driver of change in, in, in this scenario is, is societal, where the energy users recognize the, the impact of their energy use, and they really try and drive it down. Just one note on community action before we leave it is, although it is a, a decentralized scenario, there is still a lot of centralized generation connecting in this scenario. So we have 1.5 gigawatts of offshore by 20, 2030, and we have very high levels of solar PV connecting in this, in this scenario as well. Okay, so that, that's, that's an introduction in the scenarios, and we, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll draw out more of the information as we go along. Right, so building the scenarios, there's a, there's a number of steps in, in forming up um, our draft scenarios, and I'll, I'll give you an overview of those and then go into them in a little bit more detail. So firstly, we, we define the scenario evolution. So how do we see our scenarios changing over time, and how have they changed compared to the scenarios we had in 2017? So once we've defined that evolution, we then establish design characteristics, and, and we call these the three Ds. It's decentralization decarbonization and digitalization. So the three Ds really help us to differentiate between scenarios and, and allow us to form up the, the, the storylines for those scenarios. Then in determining the level of the three Ds, we, we perform qualitative assessments using external drivers. And they are policy support, consumer engagement, technology development, and economic growth. So there is there is a scale of, 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 of um, of, the, of each of the three Ds, and those drivers really, really determine where on that scale a scenario will, will, will end up. Finally, we, we conduct a quantitative assessment where we build up our, our scenario portfolio in line with the scenario storylines, and, and, then, and then we use those assumptions, um, and, and those are the assumptions that, that are covered off in our consultation report. So again, we, the, and, and we end up with our, with our draft scenario, scenarios. So, so so really, the, the consultation report gives gives a lot of information on the process, but key the key information in there are, are the the outputs of our quantitative assessment, and they will become inputs to our, our next phase, which is the generation dispatch modeling. Right. So so a little bit on energy and climate policy and, and how they've influenced our scenarios. So so, so this 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 is a, a decarbonization. Um, a long-term strategic vision of decarbonization for the EU, and it it maps out a pathway for the EU achieving um, a 1.5 in line with the IPCC report. And so it, it's showing we we, I don't, we won't go into it in too much detail, but if we focus on the power sector, which is blue, it's showing that in order to to meet the targets set out by the Paris Agreement, the power sector will have to go net zero by 2040 under this scenario. And, and, and the general theme or, or direction of travel displayed by the chart is that carbon emissions will need to reduce significantly in the period out to 2040 and 2050. So then ta taking that EU context and, and looking closer to home, recently we've had the Climate Action Plan, which, which was released a, a month or two ago, very, very, very welcome publication um, on, our, on our part. Um, and it identifies cost-effective pathways to meet 2030 decarbonization targets. So in line with the EU view, there, there, there are very ambitious um, requirements set out in that plan to deliver on the 2030 targets for Ireland. So again, we've taken figures from, from the Climate Action Plan. Um, it's a very wide-ranging um, plan and it covers all, sec all, all aspects of the economy, but from a, a power sector um, perspective the, the marginal abatement cost curve is 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 really interesting and it lists out different technology options required to achieve the decarbonization targets um, I guess the, the 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 kind of overriding impact of the climate action plan and and, and the res and, and, and the DCP and, and different policy measures that are, are being formed at the moment is that they provide certainty on, on the direction of travel for decarbonizing the Irish economy and in particular the power system. So that, that's had an impact on, on our scenario evolution. And it's meant that the scenarios we had in 2017 have, have now become three. So um, the slow change scenario is, is, is no longer 
um, relevant considering its, its ambition in terms of decarbonisation and we are, we are confident that delayed transition, centralised energy and community action really cover the envelope of, of outcomes that we expect over the, the period to 2040. So in terms of study years, we'll be looking at all three scenarios across three different study years. It's 2025, 2030 and 2040. So that's consistent across all of the documents that you'll see in the TES 19 series, including the um, system needs assessment. Okay, so, so this, this is my last slide and it, it, just a little bit on, on the scenario design characteristics and how we've used them to, to form up our scenarios. Um, this image is, is, just to explain it, is, is a mind map. Um, its aim is to describe the, the three design characteristics, the, the three key pillars, and how different technologies relate to those design characteristics. Um, so, so starting off with decarbonization, the scale here explains where the scenarios fit in a scale of low to high decarbonization. And we can see that delayed transition is, is, is a moderate scenario in terms of decarbonization. It doesn't meet the RESI level, in, the targeted RESI level in 2030, and it's behind targets in electrification adoption. Um, centralized energy is, 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 is more of a, a higher decarbonization target. It, it meets RESI targets in, in electricity, but it, it doesn't quite meet the targets in electrification of heat and transport. And then with community community action, it's, it's a very much a high decarbonization scenario, and it's it's going towards 100% CO2 emission reduction by 2050. So going towards 1.5. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very much driven on the demand side by adoption of technologies um, and, and really engagement in DSM and technologies um, kind of using smart metering data. On digitalization, uh, the two technologies really driving digitalization uh, are, are data centers and, and smart technologies uh, such as smart metering. Um, we see data centers really influencing the three scenarios um, in terms of build out rates. So data center demand for delayed transition aligns aligns with the GCS demand level for the, the GCS low demand level. Um, centralized energy is aligning with a median data center demand forecast and community action with a high GCS data center demand forecast. So what's really key to, to the, the demand in terms of data centers in each scenario is the build out rate and how quickly we, we see that, that demand materializing. And, and again, uh, smart technologies have a really big impact on digitalization, especially in, in community action and centralized energy. Then lastly, um, decentralization, we have a, a scale of low to high. Um, so centralized energy being the most centralized or, or the least decentralized scenario, and it, it's mainly driven by high levels of um, renewables connecting to the transmission system. I, I mentioned the offshore renewable target earlier on. Delayed transition really aligns with the current state of play with an even share of renewables on distribution and transmission. And community action is, is very much a, a decentralized scenario, both in generation and demand. So that, that's, that's a, 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 an overview of the scenarios and, and, and the framework that we've used in developing them. I'll now hand over to Podrick and he'll, he'll go through some of the, the, the key assumptions for generation demand and interconnection. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks John. Um, so we haven't included every aspect of the document uh, in the presentation. We're just going to cherry pick and, and hone in on, on a couple of aspects. Feel free to ask any question you would like if, if, if it's not covered. I'll start with a macro view and then I'll, I'll delve into delve into some of the technologies. Um, so demand, total electricity requirements. As you can see there, there's significant growth across a number of sectors over time. These forecasts are they're critical because for a given resi target um, the level of renewables required to be installed to, to hit that number is completely driven by your demand forecast. So <clears throat> with the different sectors that we've included, industrial which includes large energy users which is uh, also includes data centers, 
tertiary, there's commercial sector, residential, um, transport and losses. So with this is, is key to determining rather than, well, rather than just how much demand is the timing of that demand is key as well. So what we've broken down here is the electricity growth per sector between um, our study years. So what you can see here is that the majority of the growth between 2020 and 2025 is based on large energy user demand. Um, following this, then you have, you have your uptake in, in the electrification of mobility, and then further on in time, you have the electrification of heating in the residential sector with the uptake of air source heat pumps. Um, they're obviously happening, you know, a, a little, you know, they're they're all starting from 2020, but obviously this is showing the the when when are the different sectors moving um, at, at faster paces. Interesting to note there, tertiary demand we, we we've assumed goes negative. Um, between 2030 and 2040. So what that assumption means is that efficiency gains in that sector is outstripping any um, growth in, in volume due to, due to economics. Um, I, I suppose that what we're pointing out here at the end, it, it, with, given that there's sizable electricity demand growth expected, we, we just thought we'd touch on why is this happening. So with the electrification of heating and transport, if we focus on the residential and, and, and transport there, by electrifying you're reducing the primary energy consumption because you're, you're, you're fuel switching and you're, you're taking that oil uh, um, out of the energy system. Um, uh, and it, I suppose it, 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 it's key to the country in general that, that, that those sectors electrify. Um, Focusing then in on a couple of technologies, as Kieran said, with our large energy user demand, uh, it, it's uh, based on our, the work that our colleagues do with the, the generation capacity statement. Just for reference here, we, we've put the install capacity of the large energy users in reference to expected 2020 peak demand, which is five and a half gigawatts in Ireland. So you can see that it's it, it, it's a it's a it's a sizable um, component of that. And the, the, the range in, indicates uh, the, the uncertainty um, with respect to the, the build-out rate. Transport, um, so on the right you have the, the, the components of transport that um, were considered in, in the Climate Action Plan. Um, on the left, ju just a summary of, of what was in our own consultation. So, we, we considered the passenger vehicles, delivery vans, light trucks and buses that were a part of the Climate Action Plan. Um, we didn't have any assumptions on the electrification of freight. Um, common consensus that a liquid fuel is, is going to drive those heavy goods vehicles, compressed natural gas in the sh short medium term, and then if that fully decarbonizes, perhaps hydrogen in the longer term. We didn't have any information on, on rail in our consultation. We hope to. In the final one, um, with the expansion of the DART, um, Metro North, etc. So we're hoping to get feedback on that. Um, what we're showing here is the uptake of passenger vehicles and delivery vans. So our community action scenario aligns with with those numbers in in, in the climate action plan. So you can you can see the nine hundred thousand there in in, in twenty thirty. As an interesting exercise, we thought we'd kind of compare that growth against what was seen in Norway. So it's a market leader at that 46% share of, of EVs last year. So once you take that share, um, the, the data between 2012 and 2018 and, and apply that to the, the Irish market, you get that red line. So you can see that all the scenarios fall below it, but community action isn't far behind it. I suppose a big part of of the work to come um, for for ourselves and the scenario team is actually looking at how do you take those energy demands and shape it across time to get time series and ultimately what impact does that have on peak demand? So we're going to be working with our NCE colleagues on on creating time series for for different um, modes of of electrified mobility. Okay, moving on to generation. Um, I suppose the key the key criteria for for, for renewables is, is is currently is resi, so it was it was a, is a critical design parameter in our scenario. So as Kieran said, to hit the seventy percent target in twenty thirty with one acting as a counterfactual, 
Um, then heading toward 2040, con community actually keeps on, keeps on increasing at, at a significant rate. You can see that centralized energy falls off, and this is the impact of carbon capture and storage. So if you're decarbonizing um, your firm, dispatchable generation, um, there's less of a need to keep installing um, variable renewables to hit the same CO2 reduction. Okay, um, moving on to the renewables build-up. So, so just a note on, on, on the terminology here. So additional renewable energy volumes. By additional, what, what I mean is this is new or, or added renewable energy uh, production on top of what's required to meet the 2020 targets. Okay, so, um, and by outturn, that's post curtailment. So th th this is what we need in addition to what we already need for, for the 40% the resi target in 2020 across our scenarios. So as we're diving into the mix, you can see that offshore wind takes up a sizable component of the centralized energy production. Onshore plays that role in community action and delayed transition is a bit more of a balanced mix. Um, for reference, we, we've put in the REST auctions. Obviously, the high-level design was for a 55% resi world, albeit a high demand. So you can see that that those res auctions build up to to, to delayed transition, but but are not enough for for centralized energy and and, and community action in 2030. Um, we we we've, we've no view on 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 how that would get there, whether it's more auctions or PPAs, etc. Um, here we're just illustrating uh, the volume of new renewable energy required and which is ultimately driven by your demand. Okay, getting into some of the technologies. So solar, our most decentralized technology, um, strong growth in, in community action. So, so the top graph here is total solar PV installed, both micro distribution and transmission and then below you have you have your less than 11 kilowatt rooftop solar pv so what's what's driving the the microgen solar pv is the feed-in tariff um for renewable self consumers and um, coming from the clean energy package um i suppose to get some insight on, on the numbers that are the the assumptions we use to 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 get that community action um trend we have 25% of new homes um, installing with, with rooftop solar. By 2030, 15% even of existing homes uh, install solar, and that's using a, an average rating of, of two kilowatts. So you, you can flex that, that install capacity a number of, of ways with those parameters, but that's what we've used. Um, okay, wind. Um, offshore and onshore, you can see that, as earlier mentioned, centralized energy and community action take the, the envelope of, of offshore and onshore. What we'd like to point out here is with the, the three and a half gigawatts of offshore wind and centralized energy in 2030, in a 41 terawatt hour demand world, that means that, that you have only five gigawatts of onshore. Um, so it, it, there's there's tensions there between growth rates of, of technologies. Um, that's in a the solar assumed in that scenario, just for references, is, is is 400 megawatts, which came from the climate action plan. So you can see with offshore in centralized energy, most of the the growth is happening between 2025 and 2030. Um, you know that's due to you know, lead times and um, getting the math bill sorted, etc. Um, but you still have nearly a gigawatt installed by by 2025, and and thereafter you're you're looking at installing a 500 megawatt wind farm every year to hit that to hit that value. Okay, um, moving on to fully dispatchable generation. Um, we we haven't touched on or or in any quantitative uh, manner uh, DSM. Um, and storage in the consultation. So the, we've tried to classify the, the, the methods that we use, but, but the, the line of thinking or method that, that we're going with those flexibility options is that once you once we get feedback on the assumptions we make with, with 
the the supply side on, on generation we'll see how much flex additional flexibility you require in those scenarios to what we're worried about is oversupply on those technologies so once we get the trends right on these technologies we'll we'll, we'll see how much dsm and and storage we need to make sure we meet adequacy um, standards and standards and system service and energy so with osgts you can see that it's 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 falling off over time so the increase there in 2025 that's taken the t minus the latest t minus four auction results so we've even increase in in osgt capacity and then depending on the scenario the, um existing um peakers uh um mothball etc thermal plant um this is your, your, your steam fired generation. So your, your Tarbert, Money Point, the Peats, um, and you can see that there's a significant fall off um, expected. Um, Tarbert uh, is, is 2022, um, and then Money Point 2025, and, and we flex that assumption with, with Money Point and the Peats around 2025. So we're doing needs assessment. So if it's if money point is due to close down in july in in, in 2025 it, that we may as well assume it's not in the scenario and, and understand what needs might manifest in in 2025 in its absence um so ultimately post 2030 all you have is 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 waste to energy plant that technology um cgts um, we've kept constant over time so obviously if 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 you're you're thermal capacity is 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 falling away and um, we see no need for for, for CCT capacity to drop as well um, I suppose that the implicit assumption there when you see that straight line is that the capacity market and the system service market is working hard enough to keep them open um, or overhaul if they reach the end of their life before 2040 or if one shuts down another another opens up um, I suppose if we don't get any information on CCGT shutting down or building, we're we're going to assume that they repower if they come to the if if they come to the end of life. Finally, CHP, so your your traditional gas and then biomass CHP. Um, we've we've assumed a moderate growth in biomass CHP over time and um, across the scenarios. Okay, interconnection. Plays a huge role in facilitating resi, and um, when you can evacuate your your renewables in, in times of surplus, when you don't have indigenous demand. Um, so for going through the assumptions that we've taken, um, in 2025, uh, Celtic is installed before that, um, as per project timelines in two of our scenarios. Um, 2030, then in addition to GreenLink, uh, Celtic comes in 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 all three. In 2030, um, it, it, to hit your 70%, it's it, it's I think it's fair to say that that, that it's it's going to be very hard if you don't have two interconnectors. Um, whether a third can be built in that time frame, um, please provide feedback. Um, and then finally, in in, in 2040, looking out, um, with 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 GreenLink coming in, um, in delayed transition. So we're assuming there that 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 there there's some hiccup and, and th there's there's a delay in interconnection with Great Britain. Um, interesting national grid assumed no um, additional interconnection beyond the late 2020s um, in their scenarios and, and that's to do with kind of price convergence. Um, I'm not sure if they'll be locked out of, of PCI funding and stuff um, post Brexit and then with new interconnection, we, we've kind of gone in in proportion to um, your resi target. So community action has the highest resi level in 2040. So we've installed two new interconnectors, uh, one to both France and Great Britain, and centralized energy, which is less of a resi level, has has one new interconnector. Okay, so that's that. That's the end of of, of maybe a, a quick overview of of the some of the data that, that that was in the consultation and um, one thing we, we'd like to maybe just start as, as as a discussion as an industry is is the idea of co2 neutral power systems and um, as Kieran showed earlier um, in in all energy system optimization modeling that I've seen power systems decarbonize the fastest out of, out of all those sectors so it, it's our sector that's going to reach co2 neutral first 
um, if, if, if we follow the economics. So we, we thought it might be useful just to discuss um, different aspects of the power system that, that you could decarbonize because some might be harder to decarbonize than others. So th the way we've split this up is simply by the revenue streams currently. So adequacy, energy, and, and system services. Um, on adequacy, uh, in, in the latest T minus four auction results, 82% of um, the derated capacity came from turbines. So, you know, e even though interconnection and, and, and demand side and storage are, are going to play an ever increasingly an important role, um, we still foresee the need for 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 backfill generation. Um, so the reason I put this up is because I focus on decarbonizing uh, backfill generation on the adequacy side. Um, we, I, I've simplified a little in, in that in the adequacy energy and system services. Some technologies can do all three, but but uh, I, the list would be endless. So I've just focused in on some of the technologies. So. For adequacy, um, the options I have here is um, CGTs with, with CCS, and if there is resi residual CO2 in that, in that, let's say it only captures 90 or, or any number less than 100%, that residual needs to be offset somehow, whether it's negative emiss emissions technologies with forestation or, or direct air capture or whatever. Um, CGTs could run on 100% renewable gas, perhaps less likely, um, with, with kind of Feedstock can be can be a very contentious um, area if, if if it's not coming indigenously. Um, if you want to go negative, you have bioenergy with CCS. Again, the long term question there is is using biomass for electricity production the right uh, avenue for 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 that. And finally, nuclear just 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 to finish it off, even if it, if it's not feasible currently. Um, energy obviously takes the most amount of focus currently um, with, with your res targets. Um, uh, but DSM there, I'm, I'm not talking about energy shifting, I, I'm, I'm talking about the megawatt not consumed um, in, in that case. Um, and then system services, <clears throat> I suppose that we've, we've we're 22, we, we will have 14 system services. I've, I've, Broadly, them generalized by by theme here, and then that there's there's a, a rich set of technologies that that can that can meet the, meet this um, kind of necessary um, security services. Though um, few can few can do all. Um, okay, concluding remarks. Uh, it's fair to say that there's there's certainly a growing trend on sector coupling, both on the end use side with with electrification and also then on the energy carrier side in, in in terms of maybe longer term looking with gas, electricity coupling and and seasonal storage options. Uh, it's not a huge insight to say that there's significantly significant electricity demand growth expected, and with electrification, that's on top of of data center growth and another large. Um, industrial users, so we've quite a challenge on our hands to to hit a seventy percent um, target. And um, just thrown out there that that you could argue that in the longer term, resi is a less meaningful metric, and the idea of applying carbon budgets to the power sector might show a trend that 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 um, we need to follow. And then in all of this, to hit seventy percent resi. It's it's fair to say that that on our part, timely uh, and effective delivery, both in the planning and operational time frames, is key to, to make sure um, we get there. And please use the survey provided when providing to the consultation. Um, we ask that it's a data-driven um, response. Um, there, 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 there's be a tend to be war and peace um, style responses to our consultation. So. Please have it data and, and insight driven. If you use the survey, then we have statistics that we can give back to you anonymized in, in the final report in terms of, you can then see where your feedback lands in terms of the, the spectrum of the industry. Are you an outlier or, or is everybody saying the exact same thing? Um, great, I'd just like to thank colleagues, both, both internal and external that have worked with this to date. 
Um, we certainly haven't done it on our own, um, and for Engineers Ireland for, for hosting us. So we're happy to take any questions. Okay, I think we're on. So just to kind of get the ball rolling, we're going to start with one of the online questions. So, Podrick, you're, you're first up here, I'd say. Um, so this is in from Mike Renewable. Um, we'll call out the full email address. Um, so can you provide some commentary on how battery energy storage systems would impact the scenarios? Uh, sure. So, so in the consultation, we characterize storage in, in, in a number of manners. So I suppose the longer duration storage, uh, I don't know, four to eight hours perhaps. We only had a two hour battery uh, in, in the latest auction, but, but just for argument's sake, four to eight hours. Um, you know, they're, go they're going to operate in, in, in terms of uh, when your forecast is wrong, it, it, it'll pick up and, and, and supply the, the demand to be met. Um, then on the shorter time screens, you're, you're going to have 30 minute batteries that are, that are going to be maybe obviating the need to part load a CCT um, for reserve provision um, that, that, that on those shorter time scales you, you could have all your reserve provided from, from those technologies. So I don't want to bluff about, you know, the, the optimization model will tell us exactly how each storage component is met, but, but broadly that's the, that's the view that we'll see. There'll, there'll be a requirement for, for flexibility when your net load, net load ramp is outrageous and, and you, you can't ramp other resources as quickly um, to, to meet demand and, and then on the shorter time scales it'll be providing reserve. Great. Um, any other questions from those in attendance here today? Uh, Michael Moore from Elegant Energy. Um, I suppose first of all it was a very useful presentation and it's, it's great to kind of get the insights to it. And um, I suppose it's important to note that, you know, the information that you're putting out here uh, goes out into the wider industry, and not only in Ireland, but right across Europe, right across the investment community about uh, the opportunities in Ireland over the future years. So I suppose just to kind of put the context to, to I suppose, the questions that, that, that I'm asking. And um, you very much underplay the opportunity there for solar energy uh, and even in your community action, uh, which you say is kind of a, an ambitious target of 1500 megawatts by 2030. I suppose the context is that already now there's over 2200 megawatts through planning and our new grid system is, is a planning led one and future auctions are going to be both grid and planning. Um, the the industry would would take a view that you're looking at anywhere between five and eight thousand megawatts of solar by 2030. So I would say that what you are, I suppose, the inputs to this already we would believe that are out of date. Um, and I suppose the question is, what can influence the final report on on what you're producing, and what is the scope of influence? If the industry is telling you that there is a considerable increase in in that level. How much weighting are you going to put onto industry's response? Um, well, one thing I didn't mention with with the energy share build up um, with solar and, and offshore and onshore is, is that if people have analysis done on the likely winners of res auctions, uh, um, we'll we'll take it so that, that we can we can get better trajectories for for each technology. Um, we. I suppose we are in an auction world, so there there is it, it, there's supply and demand. So you know that if if we have five gigawatts of solar, then something else comes down, and whether that follows the MAC curve or not, you know that that wouldn't necessarily follow the MAC curve that that was provided in the climate action plan. So it, we'll we'll take all the data you have, and, and we're not we, this is. Our attempt to be the most uh, transparent and follow the best data and insight that we have. So, please provide it, what it, you can. If, if it's a case that the solar industry comes back and says, "Look, there is there's greater ambitions here," the data is proving to that. What weighting is given to that in your decision making? Well, I think um, as probably touched on, it, it's all about information and, and, and 
the, the richest sources of information. Um, in, in the draft scenarios, we, we, we very much took took a lead from, from the Climate Action Plan and, and the outputs of, of the MAC curve. We also have information on connection applications which have, have influenced our, our renewable mix, say. Um, but if, if there is further information available, such as the, the, the megawatt numbers you've mentioned in planning, and, 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 and we have sight of that, well then, we, we, we'll try and adopt as much of that into our final scenarios. But, but I think the, the key consideration here is, is to do with the res and, and, and somehow predicting the outcomes of the res auction. So there's, there's only there's a finite amount of, of demand that will be on the system in, in the res years, and, and it, it's difficult with, to be 100% accurate in terms of, of, of what renewable what the renewable share will be. But 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 to answer your question, um, you know, we're very much aware of, of, of how of how our, our consultation lands within the industry and beyond, um, and and that's why we, we take the best publicly available information informing them up. But as part of the consultation, um, this is a, a call for evidence. If there's data available that we can use, well, we, we, we welcome it. Do you mind me asking then, you're, you're predicting the res auction results already in, in advance. The data that you're getting for that, is it through the department and the McKenzie report that was done with the department? Or if you look at what's happening right across Europe, both the UK, in, in Holland, in Belgium, in Germany, where you have, I suppose, a lot of technologies competing against each other that are, uh, I suppose, you have the likes of solar, you have offshore wind, they're becoming very cost competitive. And I suppose it's just that the balance of mm. your outcomes really are, lot, you know, I suppose, sided towards a particular technology. That's, I suppose, yeah. that's, that's really what yeah. you're saying. We're, 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 we're not predicting mm. rest uh, outcomes, like the scenarios is flexing the envelope to so that our investment decisions are, are robust to, to that future envelope. So we, we, yeah. we, we haven't tried to, to, to predict the rest. Mm -hmm. But but other other people in the, in, in the market will, and if, if you're willing to provide that information, we'll see can we use that to, to, to shape our, our envelopes. Certainly. Can I just ask a general question? Should we just, uh, so, so that the online viewers can, can hear? Okay. Yeah, thanks, okay. Dennis. Thank you. Hello, just see if um, Just a general question. As we move towards, say, the centralized energy scenario, how do you achieve the delicate balance between um, making progress and achieving the targets? How do you consider, the, I guess, the, the pragmatics of keeping the lights on at the same time? Well, well I suppose that will come out of the, the system service modeling and, and the generation dispatch modeling that, that we'll embark on. So, so at the moment, we have, have a view on. on on, on say that the, the generation mix required to meet the energy demand and um, the plexus modeling will then tell us what kind of services are needed to achieve those resi levels like the, there's there's significant work on undergone already like we won't install any new technology that hasn't been tested and, and proven to, to, to meet those services so we have the the QTP the qualification trial process so for wind providing emulated inertia or, or any new technology that, um, uh, it will be tested before it's before it's connected. But, but ultimately, the the system server market will determine which technologies come along to to meet the requirements you have been mentioned. Okay. Hi, uh, Noel Cunniff, uh, Irish Wind Energy Association. Um, first of all, I'd just like to congratulate Kieran and Porig and the whole TES team. I think this has been a, a very good evolution of the initial TES 2017, and there's a lo lot of new information there which will be very useful for, for the entire industry. Um, just in relation to information that uh, we'll be providing as part of our consultation feedback, we've surveyed all of our members on the pipeline for onshore and offshore wind generation, which is coming through in the next decade we're seeking information on likely transmission stations they'll be connecting in whether they'll be transmission or distribution connected years they'll enter planning so we'll have a lot of information in our response that will hopefully be able to shape some of your thinking on the location of future onshore and offshore wind generation um, we would caution the use of the uh, I guess historical grid applications uh, as a source of locations uh, there was a, a lot of speculative um, applications submitted over the past decade and a lot of those projects aren't real anymore um, so I guess when you're talking about locations for any technology ask the industry and you'll get your best feedback from there um, 
maybe just a, another point I'd like to make and maybe just something that you might be able to touch on. Uh, the TES can play an exceptionally important role in the future of auctions. And what I mean by that is it provides industry with an enormous amount of uh, inputs into their auction bid development. Um, the entire TES process now, not just the scenarios, but also how it impacts on the future system. When technologies are entering into an auction, they're going to have to estimate future curtailment and constraints over a 25-year period. And your document is a, a powerful information piece for that data and for that input. So just uh, I would really like to know kind of what information you're expecting to present both in this document and in the final system needs assessment at the end of the year, uh, which would be of benefit to, to developers for, for auction design. Do you want to take the take those outputs? Um, sure, yeah. Um, we probably won't go into the production costs. Um, we'll we'll probably just just look at fuel type penetrations, um, CO two reduction achieved, resi, um, and then you know how does the storage in DSM etc operate to, to deliver those targets? Um, and cur curtailment levels. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just 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 on on, on Noel's point, um, it's it's good to hear that you, we haven't made you're happy with how how the scenarios have evolved. But but just on the point on on information, um, and just going back to a previous question, and uh, that that's really useful to 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 to, to for you to say that you you'll be feeding in that information, and and I guess this is a call for evidence for for that type of information. We, we know that there's a limit to the accuracy in terms of, of the data that is available on future connections. Um, and, and we're not in the business of predicting the outcomes of res, but we, we are really looking for, for any additional information that will help us in determining the, the future res mix in particular. And, and we, we, we have ambition to, to provide more detail in this assessment. So all, all ideas are, are, are very welcome. Um, hi, Michael McCarthy from the Irish Solar Energy Association. So I have a comment and then I have a question. And I just want to reaffirm some of the points made by Michael Moore of Melgan. Um, the All of Government uh, Action Plan on, on Climate, I think, is a very good document. It's very, you know, very in-depth, very ambitious. However, in terms of solar, it is markedly unambitious. And it's understating the ambition of solar out to 2030. It talks about up to 1.5 gigawatts. And this reaffirms the point that Michael Moore was making in terms of evidence and submissions, and we've had several of them with different agents of the state or different agencies within the ambit of the state over the last couple of years. And there seems to be a theme that despite the evidence-based submission, uh, that a decision is arrived at that almost doesn't take cognizance of the science uh, and the evidence-based submission by the association. And believe you me, it is arduous. Uh, to put together uh, those various strands of information, and when you look at you know the 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 you know the big uh, launch in relation to to um, the all government plan on climate, it is markedly unambitious. Now we're on a campaign to ratchet up that ambition because the evidence is there, and to reaffirm that point by Michael Moore, uh, we're up around 2.8, 2.9 gigawatts in terms of planning and grid, and that's uh, incontrovertible. So. I, w I think it's necessary to make that comment, acknowledge the, this morning's presentation, and end with this question. In terms of this consultation, is there any role with the department itself, either in terms of the process or the eventual outcome before publication, or is it completely independent of the department? I, I, I can tell you that. It, it's, I, I can say it's com completely independent. Uh, I guess we, we, we've... We've taken the climate action plan as, as, a, as a source of information, um, much like, I suppose, other stakeholders in the room. Um, so, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely been produced independent of the department and the work on the climate action plan. I guess the, the, the figures set out in the climate action plan are, are, are mainly related to the marginal abatement cost curve and, and some of the, the adoption levels for, for solar PV are, are kind of determined based on that. If 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 there's a, a different outcome um, which would materialize through, through, through use of a different approach, um, well, well maybe that, that information could be fed back to the department. Um, but just going back to your, your, your comment and the, the, the rich source of information you have in terms of, of um, grid connections and, and planning applications, we, we're, 
we were delighted to get hold of it and get sight of it and, and to try and adopt that into the final set of scenarios. Okay, that's great. Just to hit on another one there from um, the, the inbox for today. So Liam Lee from Carbon Trust. Um, in all scenario planning methodologies across the global energy industry, they have tended to underestimate the part renewable energy would play in the electricity generation mix. How is there we're dealing with this conversation bias and could a confidence measure be applied to the scenarios to highlight air grid confidence in each scenario? Uh, we, we don't put probabilities to our scenarios and um, they're, they're, they're just envelopes um, to, to, to test. Um, yeah. So, so, so I guess the, the scenarios being used in the grid development process, they, 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 they allow us to test whether or not needs materialize against a credible range of outcomes. Um, if, if, if they do, well then they'll pr proceed then onto a, within the, the grid development process and be studied in, 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 in a lot more detail. But it, as, as Padraig said, that there's no waiting, waiting giving to one scenario over the other. Uh, we're in Lynch from the ESRI. Um, just to echo all of the praise and congratulations, this is a really helpful event so far. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of pick up on the previous question actually, um, just around the, the kind of the probability space and the uncertainties around the scenarios. Now I get that you're not putting probabilities on them, but I'm hearing a lot about the marginal bait and cost curve and uh, you know it kind of underpins the climate action plan and then you guys seem to be kind of drawing on that for, for obvious reasons. but. There are inherent uncertainties in all of these things, and we're talking about um, high-cost, long-life assets here, and there are real path dependency um, features of something like power system planning. So, um, you know, the the MAC is there, and and we have to work off it. But how? This might be a question for kind of the the subsequent publications. But um, how much can we? just do a little fiddling around like for a small change in inputs what's the change in outputs we need a kind of a robust scenario that can stand up to some deviations from some of these assumptions so for example if your if your assumed level of ccgt is off by 10 percent that might mean one thing whereas if your assumed level of um electric vehicle penetration is off by 10 percent that might mean something compl something else entirely so just a little bit um, just about how to take account of these uncertainties and about just flagging which ones are really important in terms of the variability around them versus other ones that maybe don't don't uh, would would prove robust under any set of um, sensitivities. Yeah, um, like uh, I suppose we, we we don't have any like we didn't conduct an energy system optimization, you know, so we're not we're not feeding in input parameters and then letting the model decide. Okay, this 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 is the the composition of the, the system. Therefore, it's trying to write down your design criteria and make sure coherency is squared away in in terms of path dependencies. Um, you, you know, like if you have a lot of if you have a lot of four hour storage, why would you have you know OCTs? Um, and path dependency is critical. Uh, and, and you know the power of drawing those lines between today and 2040 you can see any inconsistencies if we've done our scenarios right the lower and upper bound should make us robust to, to changes in the future um, if, if there if there's a better mechanism to to, to deliver robustness we, we have to, to take I think the the, the, the long term the long term view is important as well in, in a system needs context. Um, we're looking out to 2040 and we're we're, we're almost screening for for future needs and and for needs that that are well understood and well known. They they, they are being studied in a lot more detail and and they appear in our transmission development plan. Um, so so you're right in 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 what you're saying about the sensitivities. But but I suppose. Um, the, the grid development process and, and the, the, the kind of rigor of, of analysis that's performed at different stages should help us pick up those sensitivities if they are, if, if, if needs are sensitive to them. 
and we don't pretend that we'll have the right answer. Like, like the scenarios are refreshed every two years to, to account for, you know, the, 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 the huge amount of, even in technology shifts with, with direct air capture and stuff like that, that, the narratives are getting stronger and stronger over time, even batteries. So um, that's another avenue to cater for mistakes. Hi, I'm Kate Ruddock from Friends of the Earth. I think I have quite a simplistic question, but I'd like to answer it. I'm just thinking about to essentially have a totally transformed energy system that essentially doesn't use fossil fuels and is net zero emissions. And I'm just wondering, are your scenarios getting there? I, I, I missed the beginning, so I apologize if, if you already said this, but it seems like you're kind of basing the scenarios on existing plans like the Climate Action Plan, which is... Um, it's almost a political document, it's not in legislation. We have other plans that, like the National Energy and Climate Plan or the National Mitigation Plan, which are kind of more statutory based, which are entirely unambitious, I suppose. So I'm wondering if you flip it around and you start with where you want to end, how close are, are your scenarios to, to getting us there? Uh, so, so one thing we, we like to show in the final document is the, the CO2 gap. So how, how, how far away are we? Um, Again, we, we don't have a, a, a very rigorous, you know, net, net zero is economy. It, it, it's, it's not even energy system, you know, so, so net, net zero ambitions consider agriculture, etc. Um, we do do <coughs> a, a, a checks in the wider energy system with, with heating and transport to make sure that we have right fuel switching. So we have a broad view of the CO2 output. Um, of the world that our scenarios fit in, not not, not just the power sector, but but, but broadly a, a bit further. Um, one of our scenarios hits a hundred percent CO two reduction in in twenty fifty in a, in our models, and um, that that are probably quite high level. So they're toward it, but they're they're like the, the honest answer is the country is it's miles away from from net zero twenty fifty battle. Like the power and sector has to go CO2 neutral in 2040 to, to get the country to go uh, greenhouse gas emission neutral in 2050. So they're, they're, And if I'm wanting, what I'm hearing right from the wind guys and the solar guys, they're trying to say, we're more ambitious than what you're letting us be. We want to do more. How, how are you going to take on board their ambition and put it into a future scenario where it becomes realistic? Because it seems like you're almost predicting the future, but then what you predict happens because yeah. you yeah. set out the parameters and then people uh, respond in what you predict. Yeah. Well, I, I think in, in respect to the, the wind and solar guys, it, it, it's really about understanding the potential outcomes from the res options and, and we're, we're, we, we can't predict that and we're not trying to, but we, we are looking for additional information to help us maybe uh, form up a, a credible range of outcomes. Um, so, so we're we're limited we're limited in terms of, of of the information available to us. So, so if there is information out there that would help us with that, it's, it's very welcome. Okay, and um, you just said something that we're miles away from where we need to go. Could you um, give us some hope that we might get there? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, I. I Consensus in, in in the energy systems modeling world that that that, that I have a little bit of part of suggests that the world is is way off 1.5 degrees. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I guess just just to add to it, um, I suppose the the power system going net zero um, and, and to go net zero by 2040, there are carbon carbon removal technologies that that that, that would be required. So, so CCS is is we play a very important role in that. I know there's there's a there's a a board or, or a steering committee that's been set up as part of the the climate action plan to investigate that. And um, but and there's also technologies with direct air capture. And, 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 but to, as Padraig has said, that there, there's a long way to go. It doesn't mean yeah. you don't aim for it as best yeah. you can. Mm -hmm. um, because we, you know because. The more you put it off, that the more you have to do in the future, and that's going to cost you more. So, it, it, there is there is really cool work done on the impact on the economy of decarbonisation measures. And yes, it is 
uh, expensive, but that percentage gets lost in the noise of, of you know, macroeconomics further down the line. So yeah, it, 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 if you go out far enough, it makes sense to do it now. Um, but whether it, whether it actually will be delivered is is, is separate. Uh, hi, how's it going? <coughs> My name is Nick Ennis from Elgin Energy. I just have a question about capacity markets um, and in terms of where renewables rank in the award, in that auction that's awarded. Um, so I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but, but a derating factor gets applied. So there, there's a methodology there to say, okay, it, on a per unit basis of one, um, what out of one, what am I going to give it that it, it, I can trust on it being there in, in, in times of peak demand? Okay, good. And is that trust improving for renewables? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's based on data. Um, you know, so... It, it was a very high derating factor. Yeah, so, so you don't rely on them. 0.2 or something like that. Okay, and the ones that actually generates that do get awarded the, the capacity in the auction, are they um, expect to have that in reserve, or how does that work? Um, well, it, well, if you if you're part of the capacity market, and there's, there's, correct correct me now if I'm wrong, people in the room, but it, you're you're basically saying that I, I will turn up when I'm most needed. So if you don't turn up when you're most needed, you're going to get hit with a penalty. So there's, there's a kind of a, there's a risk hedge there. And so I, I think some renewables don't play in the capacity market because there is a, there's a risk that, that the wind output isn't blowing when it's peak demand and therefore they, they get penalized um, for, for not being there when most needed. Okay, thanks very much. Just uh, down here. Um, James Curtin, uh, Hydrogen Ireland Association. Um, so the first thing I'd like to say is, is it's welcome to see some sector coupling uh, on this report um, and basically within the um, storage section, seeing some seasonal storage uh, potential around power to, power to gas um, and hydrogen. Um, just, I have a kind of a question really. Um, I, like, I tend to have a number of people, industry companies, etc., come to me um, and basically looking at, you know, is there options at, a, at tens and hundreds of megawatt scale to produce hydrogen um, because they can't get grid access or they're over, over um, uh, capacity or over production on their sites, etc. Um, so just a kind of question we have there, grid, in relation to grid resilience and grid infrastructure uh, with increased renewable energy and hopefully the... Um, ambitious targets of the solar and wind industry. Um, so just kind of, you know, where does, where does that scenario come in in the report in relation to grid resilience and connecting up the renewables and so on? Well, it, it's, it's, not, it's not covered, I suppose. Um, the, the scenarios piece is step one in the grid development process and it's really um, designed to help us identify those future needs. Um, and we then follow a, a series of steps in, 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 in kind of determining the the most robust investments required to, to alleviate those needs. So it's really a, a very early view on, on where needs may materialize, but it doesn't go into the solutions that we might need to, to facilitate um, connections of, of renewables or, or any other forms of generation. So, so for, for information on that, and the, the Transmission Development Plan, which is a 10-year outlook, will detail the projects required to meet needs over, over that time frame. Any more questions from I before? take a few more. Yeah. Um, maybe a dispatch model specific question. Uh, just did do you um, delineate between existing and repowered and then new, say onshore capacity in the model? And then if you do um, have you made any assumptions for the repowering potential over the next decade? So we're looking over at Noel for this now. Um, for for, re, oh. for, <laughs> for, for, for repowering, we, we have made assumptions. Um, we've assumed that um, if, if repowering occurs, it, it will occur to the to the same level of installed capacity, um, and, and that's it's it's maybe a convenient assumption based on on the lack of information that we have. So we've assumed that. Uh, uh, expected life for, for a wind farm 
and, and we are repowering once that end of life is achieved. With the higher capacity factor. With a higher, yeah. yeah so it might be the same as solar, but, but, but its capacity factor will go from, uh, in, in a typical climate year, 31% average to 35 is, is what we've assumed. Maybe just to follow on from that point, uh, Noel Conniff, Irish Wind Energy Association. Um, we have a repowering working group amongst our members now, and we're currently carrying out analysis this summer that we probably won't have for your deadline by next Friday, but we'll have it before the end of August, so hopefully that's okay. Um, looking at repowering potential over the next two decades, uh, we're taking a survey of all of our members, the age of the fleet and considerations that they're taking into account when repowering. Um, just to give an idea of possible benefits of repowering, the first wind farm in Ireland uh, for, uh, has applied for planning permission for repowering in Donegal. It's a 15 megawatt wind farm with 25 turbines at the moment. It'll be going up to 60 megawatts with 12 turbines. So half the turbines, four times the power. So the potential for um, uh, growth in wind generation using less turbines is significant from repowering. Um, and just maybe a note on the capacity factors. Most new wind farms in, to be installed over the, the coming decade, particularly towards the latter end of the decade, they'll be seeing capacity factors close to 40%. Um, and some of the ones that they're going to be replacing will be in the mid-20s because they're the earlier wind farms installed in Ireland. So again, hope to submit that information to uh, the consultation response. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, Brendan Connolly from Board of Mona. Uh, thank you again for the uh, the presentation. Again, very useful contribution to the to the to the whole energy uh, evolution and discussion. Um, just a comment, firstly, on uh, you mentioned a few times the significance of the res auctions. Uh, just think that um, it's been mindful of the fact that the climate action plan did uh, indicate that a significant and increasing proportion of the renewable energy will be delivered on commercial basis and not just on, on subsidized basis and that's something that we anticipate will certainly um, increase as the, as the decade goes on as well. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I suppose come, that comes back to the fact that or the, the point, the general point that the uh, provision of grid infrastructure and, and <coughs> access to grid uh, is remains and potentially grows as as the most significant constraint if you like on the overall um penetration of renewables and, and the overall contribution renewables can make to to um, decarbonizing the electricity grid primarily and then naturally uh, the, the the wider energy system uh, so i'm just wondering in that your, your chief executive has spoken in a number of different forums uh, at very much calling a call to arms saying this is a a, a, a very much like the original rural electrification scheme, a need to, to do something completely different rather than what we've done uh, before. So I'm just wondering, in terms of this particular process and in terms of evolving that new grid development strategy, how does this fit into it? Is this just informing it, or um, may I just comment how, how that will feed into this delivery of this new grid delivery strategy that our chief executive has, has, has spoken of? Um. Well, to, to, to answer the question, I think the, the, the two processes are, are, are happening in, in parallel at the moment. Um, the, the grid development strategy, um, I can't comment on, on how informed it is um, in terms of, of, of TES. I suppose the timing is significant. We, we, we have a draft set of scenarios at the moment, which will be finalized in September, and I think the, the grid development strategy is due around that time as well. Um, so, so, sorry, I can't probably go into a whole lot of detail about how they relate to one another. Um, but, but on the, the, the PPAs, it, we're aware of the 15% target in the Climate Action Plan and I suppose the, the, the level of demand um, that we projected in the scenarios and the level of res that's provided through, through, through the scheme, um, there's a shortfall for, for, for two scenarios in particular. So, so we expect that 15% will, will, will potentially make up the shortfall. But, it could be more. It could be more, and I suppose that the, the res, uh, the, the high-level design will, will, will change potentially to reflect the new ambition in terms of res E, and, and potentially a change to demand, also. Yeah, I think people might have taken us up slightly wrong. Maybe we, we put the res up there for reference, you know, and people might have insight in terms of who might win the early auctions, and and. 
that might provide us with better insight in terms of which technologies, you know, ramp up between 2020 and 2025, etc. You know, we, mm. that that's 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 the extent of it. Um, we, we've looked at the the total energy requirement uh, across the years based on our forecasts, and then we're we're looking at okay, where's our resi target? How much renewables, you know, terawatt hours need to be delivered to to hit that target, and then that's shared across the different technologies. So. Thanks for the good question. Thank you. Michael Moore again from Alga Energy. Just going back to a point that, that Kate Ruddock made. You know, I, I think it's really important that that you guys, who you know, effectively are the smartest guys in the room here, um, and and Airgrid is, you know, really on top of its game, and really know what they're at. Are are you know, dealing with levels of penetration that no other country is dealing with. I think it's really important that you start to get get the message across to government, you know, where we need to get to and how we how we're going to get there. If it's a case that you guys are saying, you know, government's setting these ambitions, but you know, in all reality, we're not going to be able to meet it. it it's a quite a depressing thought that we're sitting here in you know in 2019 and we're looking at 2030, 2040, 2050. We're already saying that we're, we're not able to meet those targets. I think the onus is on Airgrid to, to inform the government, to inform politicians that we need to enact policy to, to enable greater levels of, of uh, decarbonization. Um, and I suppose it's just to leave you with, with that because you know you guys are extremely smart. Airgrid is a really great company, but you guys need to get out there and you need to start informing government. Yeah. Just, 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 just. That I think, I think the air grid is fully committed to meeting its targets. Um, it's related to the electricity system in particular, the, the seventy percent target, um, the the DS3 program, and its level, its level of ambition in terms of SNSP. So, so, uh, just, just to, just to be clear, uh, I don't. The, um, air grid are, are very, very kind of committed towards that, and I think that's reflected in our, in our yeah. CEO, CEO's messages that, that, that have been delivered recently. I think the comment relating to, to being behind targets is probably to do with the, the wider economy and, and, and the wider energy system and, and the, the, the level of, of activity required within some sectors which are a little bit behind at the moment. Yeah, which is you know, which has nothing to do with the deliver deliverability of, of the government's plans. You know, what we're talking about is if I'm quoting correctly that the plan delivers minus two percent greenhouse gas emission reductions to twenty thirty. And then you need minus seven percent between 2030 and 2050 to hit an 80 percent CO2 reduction economy wide. Uh, the UN report says we need a hundred percent reduction. You know that, that that's that's what my my comments refer to, and, and we we, we, uh, com we commend the department yeah, on their work today. I know you're trying to be, be realistic, and but but I do think the government will take its lead from their because you know you guys know more about the power system than anybody else in, in, in the country, and if you guys need um, you know additional flexibility in the plans, additional upgrades right across the country, you know if, if the lead has to come from you guys, and it has to it has to go back into government, the message has to go back into government that you know this is how Ireland is going to meet those energy targets. You know we saw recent elections and local elections, and you know you see a huge shift. In the last two years, in, in, in people's attitude towards renewable energy, and that's only going to continue. And I think, you know, as I said, <coughs> it's you know, it, the onus really is on energy to, to, to push, push the agenda. But if you guys don't, then nobody else will. Okay, thanks, Michael. Can we just take one more, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll finish up. Thanks. Uh, Enda, is there a, a mic for Enda? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, in the Gallagher Department of Climate Action, I suppose just maybe a response um, to Michael and maybe some of the other comments that have um, have been emerging during the discussions. Um, I think you know you must assume that government talks to Airgrid and Airgrid talks to government. 
So of course we're we're engaging on a regular basis, and of course we're taking um, we're taking cognizance of all the views that Eric could give us, as as you rightly point out, they're an expert um, in the area. Um, I mean, in terms of the res auctions, we've we've mentioned those a lot today, and obviously based on the climate action plan. Um, the the capacities in those auctions that were laid out in the high level design are going to be um, are going to be amended upwards uh, and so on. So I think in terms of the overall sort of engagement, the overall sort of policy direction around uh, around all of this, I think government are well engaged. We also take our lead from industry to some extent. I mean, we go out to consultations regularly and we get the feedback and we try and uh, mould all of the various types of feedback. Um, into a coherent policy emerging. You mightn't be happy with that uh, ultimate policy, but at the same time, in an auction scenario <coughs> with increased capacities, solar and every other technology is going to have every every chance, every fair chance of delivering on the kind of grid, um, the kind of um, uh, planning um, uh, in, uh, numbers that you mentioned. I mean, if there are real projects, if they have um, real numbers behind them, and if they stack up commercially in an auction, then happy days. Okay, thanks very much, Enda. Um, I, I think we, we'll, we'll close there. And, and um, again, I'd like to thank Engineers Ireland for for hosting the event. And um, there's some really good discussions there, some really good feedback. And um, obviously, a lot more debate to to take place. Um, but again, just to reiterate on the call for evidence, if there's data that you you can feed in as part of the consultation, please do it. Um, and, and, and thanks to everybody online who, who, who's listened in, and, and thanks for attending.